George Kitterman was taking a break from a friendly game of football on a cool December afternoon in a Chicago neighborhood park when he heard some chilling news. We had just been playing our annual touch tackle football game in Wells Park in Chicago. We quit playing and we went back to the car and get Chicago Bear or Chicago Cardinal football game on radio. And all we could hear was uh, all excitement and talking. And, come on, come on, where's the football game? Didn't, it took a while to dawn on us that they're talking about we being in war. My first reaction, and I think most of the fellas, when we found out what was happening, was the Japanese attacked us? Thank God we'll wipe them out in a week. Little did we know. <laughs> George and his friends found it difficult to imagine the seriousness of the situation they would find themselves in overseas. After his draft notice arrived in the mail, the reality of war became clear. He would leave behind his new bride and business to join the ranks of other young men, preparing for their tour of duty in Europe. I had a singer sewing machine agency in Chicago. It was going downhill rapidly because the company quit making sewing machines and switched over to war production. So actually, I was just waiting to be called. George was drafted into the Army and specialized in communications, preparing to serve as a radio operator. After months of combat training and Morse code instruction, George traveled to Europe, where he was assigned to the 4th Cavalry, 1st Army, in the Reconnaissance Corps. Shortly after arriving in Belgium, he joined his men in the midst of hard fighting that preceded the largest single battle ever fought by the American Army. We were in Belgium, and I got assigned to this outfit as a radio operator. You get fighting, you get shooting, and uh, you don't know what you're hitting, unless it's somebody right in front of you. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Luckily, he happened to find a friend in combat who shared his love for football. Their friendship began when the Germans were preparing a surprise attack that would leave 19,000 Americans dead, the Ardennes Offensive, better known as the Battle of the Bulge. The 80-mile battle area extending from southern Belgium through the Ardennes Forest and down to the middle of Luxembourg was believed to be a quiet sector for the Army divisions. Hitler and his men were advancing forward, surrounding thousands of weary GIs, unaware of the bloody battle ahead. We were west where the attack on the bulge happened. This is where I teamed up first of many times with the buddy Joe Spencer. We got separated from the others, and we were walking along the one street in town, visually searching the houses. And Joe stopped me. He said, George, I see some action in this one house over here. And I said, I'll go, Joe. You cover me from back here was all set to pull the pin on the grenade, and here's a German head and a rifle, and he started shooting at me. Desperation, you think, I put my hands over my head. That was gonna stop the bullet from hitting my head. He had taken four or five shots. I thought, how could he miss? Got out behind the hedgerow where my buddy was, and I said, Joe, I said, I don't know where I'm hit, but I know I've been hit and I'm feeling all over and looking for blood. And Joe's looking me over and he says, George, I don't, he's Oklahoma draw. He says, I don't think you've been hit. He says, I don't understand that. <laughs> There's so many houses over there did, they'd have straw on the floor. So we started shooting until we got that straw burning. And about that time, a white flag came out of the window. So the captain, accepted the surrender, and Joe and I almost passed out when we saw a whole platoon of Germans come out. How fortunate can you get? Hitler had put everything that he had and went all out on this, what's turned out to be the last big battle. Five of us, I believe, who got separated from the rest of our outfit, found a trench that looked like it might have even been used in World War I. But we got in, was just finishing crawling over the last fella when a mortar shell landed on this one guy and blew him to pieces. And it killed the guy next to him. The two were killed, and the next fella, he jumped up, holding his eye, and then the next fella and I were untouched. 
couldn't help thinking, why am I being spared like this? Supplies were running low during the month-long offensive. Snow and foggy weather conditions prevented Allied air power from reaching thousands of GIs, risking their lives to defeat the Germans. George was down to his last weapon. He was hunkered down in his foxhole, fighting off the bitter cold and thoughts of a grim outcome. His friend Joe kept him going. And there was Joe Spencer joined me. And the two of us spent the night in that ditch with the snow piling on top of us. We're both thinking, well, here we are with the bazooka and one shell. And I hadn't handled the bazooka since basic training. What are we going to do if a tiger tank comes over this rise in the road? They were feared tanks. They were so much bigger and better than our American tanks. We spent the night. Fortunately, they didn't come. And toward morning, it was still dark. Could hear tanks behind us. I thought, oh my gosh, don't tell me they're surrounding us now. And as Christmas morning dawned, we found out they were our tanks. And what a Christmas present that was. We were just glad to be alive. Finally, the weather improved, allowing General Dwight D. Eisenhower and General George Patton access to Allied air operations. They began a successful counteroffensive attack on the Germans, ending Hitler's rise to power. After the war ended in Europe, George returned home to his wife in Chicago and started a family. His friend in war picked up where he left off with his love for football. Joe Spencer went on to play in the NFL for the Green Bay Packers. George applied his business skills to services with country companies, an affiliate of the Illinois Agricultural Association, and continued to nurture his real passion. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places all day through in that small cafe the park across the way the children's carousel the chestnut tree the wishing well i'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day in everything that's bright and gay I'll always think of you that way. I'll find you in the morning sun and when the night is new. I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing 